Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Chris Matthews. Chris is a marketing consultant, advisor, and leader with a lot of tech experience and some experience in robotics as well. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Glad to have you on. So there's so many things I want to ask you about. Um, you just have such an interesting career we were talking about. I mean, you worked for specialized uh, bicycles for like 10 years. You worked for Iron Ox. Uh, you've been at some other robotics companies, Pebble before the acquisition. Um, Yep. And, you know, just just awesome stuff. I, I guess one thing that comes to mind right off the bat is, like, what made you decide to switch from, like, bicycles uh, over to, to, like, deep tech? I mean, that seems pretty sure. different, but I guess there's a lot of overlap in those cultures. Well, specialized and a, a lot of the bicycle industry has a lot of actual overlap with the way startups work and particularly the way technical startups work because – you're constantly reinventing stuff every year, right? At, especially at the high end, new products, new innovations, like it is a, it is a industry that is constantly pushing edges. And that can be on like material science and carbon fiber. It can be on suspension science. It can be on tires. It can be on aerodynamics, like so many different facets to it. And you know, one, one thing's for sure, you, you never really leave cycling <laughs> like, like the garage is full, right? And I ride all the time. Nice. And I, I still deeply value a lot of connections I have in that industry. Uh, once in a while, I get to t dip my toe back in for you know projects here and there. But uh, it it was an opportunity back in 2013 where a f guy I knew who I raced bikes with actually was getting a startup off the ground. And after a few conversations with him, giving him a little bit of early guidance, he asked if I would be part of the founding team. And I looked at that and was like, yeah, that, that seems really interesting. And so as it as is the case with a lot of startups, you learn a lot real fast, but I ended up getting a, a little bit addicted to the, uh, to, just to the pace of how, how fast startups move and how, how much new stuff was constantly happening. And it's like, as long as I can still ride my bike once in a while, this is this is still super fun. And that led to the beginning of what's now been a little over 10 years of working with different technical startups. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that's what keeps me in that sector too, is just the, the different challenges and all the interesting people you get to interact with. So yep. yeah, totally. for sure, it's, uh, it's addictive is a good word for it. <laughs> uh, what what other industry has as much sort of new things every time you not not just day to day but like across the day right like we we just went through that whole open ai debacle and like what a year that week was right <laughs> that's that's pretty good what ended up happening there i didn't even follow <laughs> like where sam altman at, ended up landing so he, he's he's back at the helm hilarious and, new, <laughs> that's new, amazing. New and microsoft now has a board seat uh i am not the best person to interview about this. No worries. Just, yeah, we can we yeah, talk no about something else. else. But, uh, <laughs> but wow, like yeah. that was like even the podcasts that were covering it couldn't cover it fast enough because by the time the podcast was out, it was a totally it, it different was, situation. It was a totally different situation again, right? Like you, you listen to like Paris Wisher and Scott Galloway try and follow it, and it's like they would have had to release several episodes a day. Yeah, makes sense to me. This is how I get my news, by the way, is just asking people what's going on. <laughs> so. Nice. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. So one of the other things I, I love about your career trajectory is I have, I have a pretty close friend. Uh, his name's Uriel Eisen. I met him in the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Club, and he now has a uh, company making bike packing buckles. So I feel like he followed like a reverse trajectory. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so sometimes it's the technical folks getting into – getting into the sport and it, it does happen yeah. but uh 
you know, there's there's lots of space inside cycling for lots of new ideas all the time. Oh yeah. Well, and this guy's definitely clever. Like I remember I got some Russian aircraft titanium years ago for a battle bot I was building and I sold him some for like some small markup on what I'd paid for it and he was trying to make lightweight bike packing gear. Mm-hmm. So he he was addicted to like, you know, can I get my tent down to like 9 ounces or you know, how light can I make the bracket <laughs> that holds the thing? I, I, I know I know folks like that. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> so um, I guess what? how would you get into marketing? What kind of keeps you in that discipline? What are some of the things that you work on and, and kind of your philosophies around that? Well, f- first I'll, I'll say thank you for calling it a discipline because that, that is something I believe pretty strongly. Like marketing is, is a discipline, not an activity. Um, I... I actually got into it just by doing it uh, and not because I knew I was doing it, but because it was what seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Uh, and I go back all the way to like when I was going through, putting myself through university, working in a bike shop and realizing that working in a bike shop was partly about getting people in the door. And so you're doing things like running group rides and hosting events and going out to you know community things where you're getting the word out about what you're doing to try and get people to show up and that then over time just got polished and polished and polished and then ended up going back to grad school uh got an mba and then got this opportunity to specialize right after that and that's where you know over the course of the next 10 years i i saw how to do it at big scale that's awesome. So it sounds like you developed a knack for it naturally, but then you got the credentials with the MBA that got you that job, and then you were yeah. able to build the pedigree from there. That's cool. I mean, the foundation of it is I've always been a storyteller, and good marketing is a you know, at its core about storytelling and and bringing people along for a ride. So that that served me as well or better than anything, and you know that's. Everything from reading reading lots of books as a kid to like creative writing on my own on my own, but uh, that that really set a good foundation. It's like that Karate Kid stuff, right? Like you don't really learn know what you're learning when you're doing it, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, I can do things. <laughs> That's kind of how I got into robotics uh, engineering, yep. right? So mm-hmm. I always like tinkering, and you know. I mean, the master's degree I got at Carnegie Mellon, I feel like just legitimized all the stuff that I'd been doing up until yep. then my whole life. But, you know, now people know I'm good at it because I had a piece of paper. <laughs> so, yeah, I can relate. Um, that's awesome. So with this latest book you wrote, uh, Start Telling People, what is some of the reasons that you, you decided to kind of sit down and, and get some of your thoughts out on paper? So that It came out in May, so been like a little over six months now and uh, it was really just it it was a chance to sit down and think what patterns have i seen across all these different industries i've worked in from yes from bicycles but also from health tech and med tech to robotics and ai uh, wearables climate tech it's a it's a big range but there were some common themes that kept showing up. And so it started out as a quest of like, I'm going to write a few blog posts, right? Like I I got some ideas in my head. I want to get them out on paper. And all of a sudden I had like a dozen blog posts as as titles. And it's like, wait a second. (laughs) These are, these are like chapters almost and kind of shuffle them around. And then like, yeah, yeah, I think this holds together. And so in the space of one day, I put together the chapter titles and, and summaries, shopped it around to a few smart people I knew, and was like, does this make sense to you too? And got a bunch of head nods, yes. I was like, okay, here we go. That's awesome. And uh, and it really focuses on marketing at, for those early stage companies, particularly tech companies. So folks, a lot like what the folks you work with, where they've maybe they've been working on something for a while. And now it's to the point where, okay, this is now a commercially viable idea. 
well, I need to stop being a secret. This actually has to come out into the into the open air. How do you make that transition? How do you get started? And a lot of the rules and a lot of the things to think about and places to get tripped up when you're at that stage are pretty different than a standard marketing 101 textbook. So what I tried to do was put together all those differences, right? I'm not going to, I'm not parroting out a bunch of basics or putting out things that, you know, are just kind of standard rote. It's, it's really, what should you think about differently for those first couple years? And how do you migrate through those quickly without stumbling too much? That's awesome. And that's the book. So it's, it's been great. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to sort of have the book out in the world and, you know, you, you get people you don't know writing reviews of it and you, you get people inviting you to talk about it and say, all right, this is, this is an interesting side quest here that, uh, it was just very available. Um, I, I don't know if you've sort of followed the process of writing a book, but not at all by but the, I'm interested. The, ability, the ability to self publish now has basically, you know, has opened up the option to write a, writing a book to a lot of people that previously wouldn't have been able to. And even a book like this, even, even done well, the audience is tiny, right? Like I, I understand it's a niche topic and there's probably not many or any publishers out there, traditional publishers that would have looked at a first time author writing about a super niche topic and said, Oh yeah, we're going to get on that one. So even though it, it has still sold well, um, it, it's, it's never going to be like a, a New York times bestseller. It's not for everybody, but for the people for whom it's for, it's pretty unique. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds amazing. I mean, I certainly can't read to re wait to read it myself. <laughs> so well, it's, it's there when you're ready. But uh, I mean, if, if, you, if you want to take the time to write your own book first, that's okay too. <laughs> I, I probably am going to read yours before I write mine. Um, okay. Yeah, which which may never happen, but I hope it does. Well, I mean, your your podcast is an outlet in in the same kind of way, right? Like this this is a thing where you used to have to have access to a radio network, and instead, you know, Spencer Krauss has a podcast that anyone can tune into. And it has an audience that is very tuned to the messaging you want to put out. Oh, it's super niche for sure. I mean, yeah. it's it's just nerds that have robotics companies or work in robotics companies. Um, Fantastic. Or, or tech fanatics. Yeah. And a few people have come up to me at trade events or, you know, reached out to me on LinkedIn or, you know, recognized me when I visit, you know, my school I went to at Carnegie Mellon uh, and he said, I love your podcast. You know, it's the best. Yeah. You interview amazing people. You know, how do you get these people to come on? I'm just like, I don't know, just ask. Yep. But, you know, it always makes you happy. So I'm, I'm glad that, oh. you know, you've been experiencing that as well. And a you know, absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 quite a thing. Quite quite a roller coaster ride for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess. um Marketing, I feel like, is is one of those things where, you know, a lot of startup founders are probably a little bit like like me, where you know they're engineers first, and then you know they start to think about business, and it's not always apparent. Like I think I think to a lot of people, there's this perception that maybe it's fluffy, but I mean, obviously that's horseshit. Like you can't sell a product without telling people about it. <laughs> and so, you know, to quote, you know kind of one of the guys whose book I read a while ago is Zig Ziglar. Like, you know, you can make the best mousetrap in the world, but nobody's going to pave a path to your door without a sales effort. And marketing's a little bit different than sales, but it's also somewhat well, similar. I mean, they're certainly related, right? You've got, you got the, the, that weird Venn diagram overlap of marketing, sales, product, and customer service. Yeah. And it's like, all communication at different points in the, I guess, funnel, yeah, and, to be cliche, and, but. And, and you like you rely on all of them in an interconnect even more interconnected than it ever used to be right it used to be more linear and now it's just it's kind of like the internet made it all messy right that's a good point yeah you're right it's not really a funnel because that implies it's a line yeah it's, like they're all working all at the same time maybe customer service like after sales and marketing before sales but products 
connected to all of them all the time. I don't know. Well, c- customer service blue that that goes through all of it, and I, I think customer service has become a brand asset more so than it ever used to be. How do you figure? Can you can you give me examples? Well, like you, you go back not that many years, right? Like ten, twenty. It's a it's a lot, but it's not that lot that much. Yeah, I yeah, agree. And you had like an eight hundred number, right? <laughs> and now some rando sees a something you did on TikTok, flips over to Twitter and writes about it. And then that tweet then gets picked up by somebody else who replies to it with a question to you, the company. And all of a sudden you, you're in this public conversation <laughs> that someone at your company has the opportunity to chime in and participate in that could be the starting of a customer relationship. And this is like, this is B2C and B2B, right? It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't play favorites. And then now you're like your social media channels become what your 800 number used to be, except everyone gets to listen in. All the oh, time. that's interesting. Right. <laughs> it's really so, interesting. And if you do that really well, that gets rewarded because other people see it. Right. And that becomes part of something you're known for. Right. But a, a brand is a promise. Oh, that's and, really interesting. So that is, that is both customer service, marketing and sales all simultaneously. Totally. Yeah. And it probably uh, feeds into your product team as well because all that feedback gets taken into consideration. Right. Exactly. And, yeah. and there's fantastic tools out there to synthesize a lot of it, you know, autonomously. So you can start seeing trends and sentiment changes without having to do bit by bit analysis. Like you can actually put metrics behind this stuff. What are some of the tools you like for doing that and kind of aggregating that, that chaotic uh, mass of data? Uh, it could be chaotic, but it sounds like it doesn't have to be. Like th- things like um, Sprout Social is, is one. Um, the um, or, or even like even what you can do inside HubSpot or uh, any of the marketing automation tools. Um, the um, uh, what was the other one? Uh, there's another one I saw recently that was really interesting. Uh, blank on the name of it right now, but like, I think part of it is it's not about the specific tool so much as just the tools change all the time, right? There's new ones introduced, and part of the mm, attitude that is really helpful in these situations is like, what's the problem we want to go solve right now, and then go out and look for what new tools or what new capabilities are out there that maybe weren't even there six months ago. Makes sense. Like mar- marketing in particular, you get, there's a deluge of new tools and new opportunities to, uh, to do things all the time. And you get pitched l- every way all the time with like, Hey, you should try our new thing, try our new thing, try our new thing. <laughs> so if you're not taking stock of like the tools you're using every six months or so, you might be missing something that's better for you, that's cheaper, that's easier to integrate with other stuff. Like whatever your tech stack is on on marketing and analytics is is something that can change really quickly and you you want to be on on the lookout for new stuff. Um, and that's more of an attitude, right? It's it's yes, you, you might find a tool that you really like and it, it goes into your workflow really well, and that's great. But the moment something better comes along, you got to be willing to figure out how to how to take advantage of it because your competitors will. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Right? This is also kind of part of the advantages of being a startup too, is you're making all these decisions from white cloth. So you get to go out and look at what are the best options and understand which one's best for you and not be tied down to a bunch of legacy decisions that you made like 10 or 20 years ago that are you know, met with a whole bunch of resistance to change. Yeah. I mean, that's a really healthy outlook, right? I, I think it's it's easy to mm-hmm. get stuck. I mean, you know, marketing or not, just, you know, like, ah, I've always been a Microsoft guy. I'll be a Microsoft guy till the day I die. Or, ah, we only use Google Drive. You know, we're never going to go away from that. And, you know. And like, sometimes that 
sometimes that does work for certain things um, because sometimes that's not the biggest problem you got to solve right now. Yeah, but, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've got a, a collection of tools that you go to on the regular. Um, I, I do as well. And I expect that list for me will be different a year from now than it is today. Same here. Yeah. Like, what, what's, I, your, what's, your, what's your favorite like cool internet tool right now? Internet tool. So when you say internet tool, you mean like just a thing I use on the internet? Yeah, like an app or can, a, a website. Can like LinkedIn what, count? Like I think that's probably. No, no. I'm I'm talking about like what do you use to edit your podcast or like what do you use? Oh, that's to, interesting. What, like, what do you, what are you using for a personal CRM or anything like that? So this is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> My personal <laughs> CRM is a combination of Google Calendar and um, and just random Google Docs that are dated with a person's name and a date that I talk to them. And if I search a name, it'll come up with yeah. every meeting log from when I've talked to that person. Um, also LinkedIn. Awesome. I mean, just yeah. if I go back, if I forget who someone was and I have a meeting with them, which does happen because, you know what, I, I – I mean, I'm sure you're like this too. You talk to, you know, like 20 people a day or something and it just, you know, start to mm -hmm. blur together after a while. Wait, sometimes, did, did, you, did you remember who I was? Yeah, of course. <laughs> but sometimes I'll go back to a LinkedIn thread and I'll say, you know, like, what did I talk to, um, you know, Steve Bohemi about, you know, and I'll, I'll mm -hmm. like, you know, read through it. And I'll be, oh, right. That's why I was yeah. excited to talk to this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so I don't know. My, my brain tends to tends to shut down and, and get kind of lazy and, and having that. What do you use as a personal CRM? Uh, it's actually mostly Notepad. Uh, so nice. it's kind of similar, but like in the same way that Mac migrates those across and syncs them across iCloud. Yeah, um, that's, that's the best. But it's it's about, in that case, it's like consistency. Um, you know, and you have to use it all the time in the same way for everybody because it's no good if like some people are there and some people aren't. Yep. I completely agree. Yeah, like, uh, and that and a, pa a good password manager. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kind of a One password is pretty awesome in my opinion. Yep. Like it's, it's yep. been super helpful. Plus yep. it's just interesting to see how many accounts you amalgamate. Right. I think I'm up to like oh, 300. Yeah, right? <laughs> and, and all, all of the stuff that's in there that you don't use anymore. And uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. When I always like roll my eyes, like ah, another portal, <laughs> you know, and then, but I feel like with, with a good password manager, you know, like you're like, ah, another portal, I can deal with this. You know? <laughs> so, yep. So yeah, not, not so bad anymore. That, that was a game changer. What are some of the other tools you like? Um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Descript is one that, uh, impresses me a lot. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen that one. That's the it, one it, that it, will take a podcast and, and like transcribe all the, I've heard about it. I've considered integrating it. I haven't yet for this podcast. I'm not against yeah, for, it. Just haven't gotten for, around for, to it. For audio and video editing, it's, it's really impressive. Um, you can, you the, can type, right? And then it, it's meant to actually do splices in real time. Totally. So yeah. you can take, you can take an audio file and you know, th this is one of one of the applications of AI that, you know, is could be used for good, could be used for not good. But, you, know, you can you can take an audio file like this one, upload it, and then it will give you a kickback a transcript. And like that's fine. You know, lots of lots of places do that, but they then you can go edit that transcript like a Word doc. That's and cool. it updates the audio file. That's really cool. Up to and including adding words that weren't said. <laughs> so like, yeah, like there's good uses for that. You could but also it, make somebody say horrible things that would end could. their career. <laughs> and you know, th this, but this is also why, you know, trust, but verify like validation on anything you see on the internet. You know, you got to think about that. Yeah. That's wild. Um, and and they're not. That's not a problem unique to them. That's a problem. You know, well, I mean, it's just where we're at in terms of yeah. the society Each and the technology. Yeah, right. Um, but I, I think the bigger the bigger piece here is that there are more creative tools available to more people now that make editing and production easier than it's ever been. And this certainly ties to marketing, right? Like what used to take an agency or 
like a, a, a gigantic production team. Now, like I've had people working for me that create incredible content at scale, like big volumes, and it's just them and like using a handful of tools. That's awesome. And you know, th yes, it takes skill. Like it, it, it still requires skill, but it is definitely more available than it's ever been. So now you see people who you, you know, used to be like, oh, you want to make a video? Like, here's an editing bay and an Avid suite. <laughs> like, <laughs> and now it's like, no, I can just make videos on my phone. Yep. And they look great. Um, so, so some of these some of these tools coming out um, are, and, and particularly when you get to generative AI, like this is, it's really changing the landscape. It's pretty wild. I mean, like I, I've, yeah. I've not used it at work as much as I could, but just seeing what's feasible and what's possible and like some mm -hmm. of the, the things that are coming out of it, it's, it's yeah. incredible technology. I mean, obviously, you know, going to go down in history, I think is one of the, you know, bigger deal technological achievements of humanity. Yeah, absolutely yeah. and and the the adoption curve on it is super fast right it was like about a year ago today the gpt3 came out right yep <laughs> and you look at and you try it and you're like holy crap <laughs> sure. uh, but then all the other offshoots of like what can be done with that and how far it's come even in a year right like and it's it's wild uh for sure but we're still very early on in in these AI days where like the, the tech is starting to form but the applications of it are still these like little point solutions on top of the surface right you very few companies have completely rebuilt themselves around AI they're yeah, using sure. AI, they're using AI on the surface to solve specific problems but um, there's a book I read recently that was made a really interesting point or an analog between that and electricity when electricity came out and like it was invented in 1879 and it took 50 years to get electricity in half the households in the u.s so you think about the scale of like how long it took to roll out because of how difficult it was to you know basically rewire houses yeah, well, I mean, probably the public utility too. I mean, you had to run cable; mm -hmm. that's yep. expensive. Right. Yep. Someone's got to uh, maintain it. New technology had to be developed to scale it. I mean, you know, you have to figure out how to do it. You know, industrial yep. scale. And and industrial was like part of that. The key of that that factories used to be powered by steam turbines. Yep. And that steam turbine ran through the whole factory, and you kind of offshoot the power out from it. And then you've got electricity. Well, like we can put electricity anywhere in specific spots. Like that means you have to basically level the factory and rebuild it. <laughs> but it also means that the pe people who do that fastest get the benefit from it quickest and can scale up potentially faster. So uh, it'll be interesting with a capital I interesting to watch AI sort of go through that level of genesis and where you see companies that previously couldn't have existed at all and and, and exist on a foundation of ai uh, i don't know what they're going to be exactly uh, I don't think or, what, or what the big winners will be but i don't think um, anybody really knows yet i mean maybe well, some people think they know <laughs> like i'm sure some of them and, are guessing correctly some of them aren't yep yeah. um <laughs> so, so yeah, here we are and and, and it's it's an intersection of all the other things that you know folks like you work on too, and the, and the folks that we know, right? Robots, computer vision, machine learning, deep learning. Like, yeah, it's all it's all starting to roll together into this. You know, it's interconnected web. There was a project that um, I worked on recently where it was um, some perception engineering work, um, and I was I was just in a project management role on this, but basically. Um, we were looking at ways to figure out what things were in an environment that a robot was operating in and where they were relative to the robot. And mm -hmm. sometimes AI was the right solution and sometimes it wasn't. And so mm -hmm. we were, I, I kind of like that, like, you know, using it as like just another tool, you know, like, yeah, sometimes it's perfect. 
Like some yep. of the things we were able to do with processing like dirty like sensor streams by applying <laughs> AI based filtering to them. Like it, it was incredible. Like you could clean up really messy data in a way yep. that, you know, was inference based, but you know, surprisingly good, you know, like pretty pretty damn impressive. Um, then other times we were using classical techniques, you know, and, and that was really, really effective. And so, you know, I think, I don't know if it's a one size fits all. I mean, maybe as the tech gets better, you know, like AI will start to supplant more and more classical, you know, control methodologies and, and technologies. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think at least where we're at right now, it, it doesn't necessarily equate to the solution for everything. It's incredible and it's amazing. And I'm, in complete awe over what's happened as you put it in the last year. But I don't know that it's the solution to every problem I face at work. So I don't know. No, pro probably not. Um, but it also is likely a solution to questions we haven't even asked yet. Probably. Yes. <laughs> and so like that, that's where things get really, like I get really curious about that. Um, but uh, it, it, it kind of reminds me of like people working on this cutting edge in in any of the spectrums, right? Like there's there's that obligation to explain what it is you're doing. and and this is some of the hardest work that I end up doing is essentially this this translation layer between a, a, a really talented engineering team and the rest of the world, right? like how do how do we take? the thing you're working on, the, the intent of what you're doing and understanding that it takes an incredible collection of intellectual horsepower to, to bring this to market, usually a big team of people, but then you got to put it in terms that people can understand how it fits into their, their world, right? Like there's, you have to be able to explain purpose and place. And so if, if you're making something like, what does it, do for them right not not how it works but what does it do for them those are different questions and then how does it fit into the life that they're living now right what wh where does it go what does it replace what does it make better um there's those two questions you, if you answer both of them that can get someone to change their behavior but if you just answer one of them it's not enough so how and why are the two questions? As well, as it, it, it's, it's what does, what does it do, right? Like, like what, what's the purpose of this thing you've made? What does it do for me? What, what is the outcome of having that as a benefit? And then help me understand where it fits. So a, a good, a, the classical one to pick on uh, would be like the Segway, right? Yeah. Which like, Pretty good phenomenal, example. <laughs> for, 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 phenomenal example of like, it's a great, like magical tech, right? Like the thing looks like it shouldn't work and it does. But there wasn't a place for that to live. Yeah, especially at the it, price it, point they introduced to that. I mean. Like e even at any price point, like yeah. where where do you ride yeah, I guess that? you're right. For like 300 bucks, I mean, you can get a hoverboard. You still don't buy it. You know? <laughs> so. And, and so it was like, it. you have to figure out not only what it does for them, but but where it where it fits in. This is like what the classical marketing world would call positioning, right? Where where's your space in the world that you want to occupy, and how are you going to communicate that that's your spot? And tech companies, particularly innovative tech companies, really have to work hard at that, establishing that because otherwise people don't understand you, and that can mean that you have a great thing. But people can't wrap their head around what it's for, so that, or or where it fits, so they don't buy it because it's it, it's anxiety building, or it's unnecessary, or, or perceived as unnecessary. Like maybe maybe it's great for them, but you know, there you and I have both purchased products over the years that once you got it, you're like, ah, this thing is way better than I thought. Air fryer. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to like it, and then yeah, I got yeah. one, and I'm like, this thing's amazing. <laughs> um, and if they could have communicated what that was going to be like to you in advance, you would have probably got it sooner. Yeah, quite possibly. Uh, so if it, if it had landed, sure. Yeah, I'm a mm -hmm. cynical bastard, yeah. but... <laughs> yeah. um, 
like the uh, the translation layer between and engineering and rest of world like crops up in really interesting ways. Like the uh, just talking to someone a couple of days ago, working on a a computer vision pro uh, project, and they they were it, it was in the context of autonomous vehicles, and they they were talking about how they solve blind spots. And what became apparent after I like probed a little bit was they didn't mean physical optical blind spots for the car. They huh. meant blind spots in the computer vision model. Interesting. I wouldn't have figured that out. Well, but it's, it's the same term, right? But in the computer vision model world, that means a very different thing than a blind spot in a car that you have to like look over your shoulder to cover. Yeah. But when computer vision starts working inside the autonomous vehicle world, well, gosh, that's gotten really close together, and now you've got a challenge to to communicate. And so you got to think through those things of like, ah, oh, we're kind of colliding with part of the world that we want to land in. We better be very, very clear about what we're trying to say. Yeah, that makes sense. So maybe instead of blind spots, say shortcoming, or like something. Yeah, like it. it there's there are plenty of ways through this, but if you don't realize it's an issue, you can be having the same conversation with someone and they think you mean something very, very different. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Do you find examples help in communicating new, new concepts that I guess maybe the public's not familiar with yet? So oh, absolutely. Like the, one, one of my favorite questions is compared to what? Compared to like an abstract notion. No, no, but like oh, that, I see. <laughs> that, is, that is the question, right? Like if you force someone to say compared to what and put things in relatable terms, you, you start building these like connection points of like, ah, okay, I see how that, it, it's it's this for that or it's it, it's similar to or I can use that as a foundation for understanding this other thing. And you're kind of building rungs in the ladder that they can climb up with you. Because like, maybe you've worked on something for three years, right? It's to you, it's second nature. And then you, you kind of like give someone the 30 second spiel that represents your most recent 30 seconds with it. And they're like, wait, 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 can you, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, uh, Compared to what is a, is a, a helpful framing question. The the other is, I mean, just helping helping someone explain. Actually, I'm going to take this one step back. You have to understand who you want to sell to, right? Like, customer segmentation becomes critical for early stage startups, and it's. One of the things that I work with with companies on frequently is like, how do we decide maybe not who the this is for entirely, but who do we want it to be for first, right? Who are the first customers that would be ideal? Because your first 100 customers often end up defining who your first 10,000 customers are. Oh, that's interesting. So you wouldn't even necessarily worry about, you know, trying to figure out what product maturity looks like when you're concepting a new thing so much as how do we just get this adopted and then what's going to happen is going to happen and you might not even be able to figure that out you know when you're at the whiteboard well it, it's you're making it for someone and there there's some kind of profile to that to that group of people something some commonality that they hold together that means like because you can't make you can't make something for everyone right like if it, if you're trying to say our thing is for everyone it's for nobody yeah Right. I don't know. Juicero had pretty good mass appeal, I thought. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so did Segway. Yeah, so did the Segway. Um, uh, the, the, the road of failures is littered with things that were for everyone. Yeah. Um, but, like, some of those are just spectacular failures. I mean, I guess with Segway, <laughs> it's, it's amazing because of the amount of money they raised. I guess with Juicero, it's similar. It's the fact that there was an echo chamber of people that were convinced that everybody would want this thing that yep. 
when exposed to a mass audience just doesn't make sense. M momentum is is very powerful, right? And is re remember that in any population, half or below average. Yeah. It's just true. By definition right? of average. So, yeah. like, <laughs> but it it means that sometimes you can build momentum in the wrong place. And so you go back to like, who would you love to have as your first hundred customers as an exercise? And you can be very, very specific about that. Oh, that's interesting. Right. And, and it can be partly because you're choosing those people based on who they will bring with them, like what momentum they create. And is that the right momentum for where you want to go with this? So, okay. So to rescind what I said earlier, that would require you to think about where you want it to be totally down the road. Yep. Okay. Uh -huh. Yep. And so long-term thinking is part of it, but you have to break it up into manageable chunks. Like, especially if you're an early stage startup with like limited resources yeah. and you know, may maybe a what, smaller team. And it also seems like you probably have to be willing to roll with the punches if, you know, maybe the market responds differently than you thought it would. Well, that, then, then you get into research, right? Like, okay, so that first hundred, what's it based on? Why do you think that? How well have you tested those edges? To what degree can you test it in advance? Um, you know, the, the ability to do things like national surveys now, incredibly easy, incredibly cheap. Um, you can get data back tomorrow on a statistically valid sample size for a very specific target demographic. And there's lots of services that you can jump in for that. Um, the one of the things with there's a whole chapter on the book in the book on this, all about data, right? Like early stage startups, you might not have a lot of data, but you have some. And it's it's false to say you can't go get some, right? So like just because you don't have data doesn't mean you should just throw up your hands and start guessing at stuff. Like, no, you, you need to have an attitude towards going to find it. Like, do, literally grab a shovel, start digging. And there's lots of ways to do that and lots of models out there to follow and lots of potential ways of even just getting, like, a little bit of data. Because, like, the, the data chapter actually includes a, a sort of podcast-type interview I did with a colleague of mine who's ex-exec at ad agencies, but like particularly adept at the whole marketing data side of the world. Oh, interesting. And, and so I think when you get to that chapter, you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy it. Um, chapter nine. And one of the things he said that stuck with me was that data is, it's all about making decisions, right? And a little bit of data gives you a little bit more confidence in the decision you're about to make. And so you might not get 100% confident, but you can, you can certainly get further towards that. And if you're just going to deal with 0% confidence, now you're just talking about opinions. And so like the op opinions can be, you know, you're probably going to take the one of the highest paid person in the room. But if you can get to data, data is a way to defeat opinions. And then the sort of pinnacle above data is being able to understand the world in a way that you get to some sort of insight, some sort of thing that says, well, the data says this, so I think this is going to happen next. And I believe that's true. Yeah, I can't prove that in advance because it's, it's a new idea. You can't prove a new idea in advance. But... I can take this chunk of data and say, extrapolating from that, I feel X amount confident that we're going to go here. And it's all just a data process, but it's how confident can you be in that and, and what can you go find out? That's interesting. So it's like a hybridized decision making where, mm -hmm. I mean, you yep. can't do it totally data driven because it's never been done before, but exactly. you can you can make your guesses more informed yep like in in some cases companies are are doing things where like they've made the best version of something right like i've figured out how to yeah, take well, a that thing would have to be data driven i would think of, of course <laughs> and, and so that's going to be vastly more biased towards the data driven side because 
you probably have a lot of access to really good data. But if you're making something that is wholly entirely new, right? There's no existing demand for it. No one understands what it is. You got some work to do. Yeah. <laughs> and you're going to learn a lot, I think, when you put the first one out or when you get it to the hands of, you know, a pilot team or a group of users or, or whatever. Right. Um, and part of that is being very methodical about going to get that data in a way where if, if you're going to try and map the data over time, that your data is consistent enough that you can see changes. Yeah. Because like you, you do a bunch of user testing and then six months later do another group of user testing and you ask all different questions with all different hardware. It's very hard to compare those two. Yeah, you they don't, know don't map at all, I would think. Right. I mean, yeah. it's like to use an example from robotics, mm -hmm. it would be like if you changed from a LiDAR to a stereo camera and you tried to mm -hmm. correlate. <laughs> well, you you could you could probably get relevant data of like, did we get more or less accurate? Yeah, and I mean, you could still map to like an occupancy grid and try to, you know, yep. put that in a neutral form so it could go into a model. Hmm. Right, but yeah. if you then, you know, say you're trying to map that onto like 3D Gaussian splats or something like that, it, then all of a sudden it's like, wait, 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 hold up. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it definitely... So how do you feel about stealth startups? I guess just to go into maybe something a little bit controversial, but sure. to, um, you know, cause that's like the ultimate, you know, like we're just going to do this in a vacuum and, you know, I don't know. I, I want to hear your thoughts. I guess I shouldn't poison it with mine. Certain, certain companies make that choice um, for usually around reasons around IP. Um, like we're trying to develop something that is, uh, defensible as long as we can get the patents around it or whatever that uh, th that protection is going to be. Um, a lot of other companies, though, they, they're they pretty open about what they're doing. And that's because they're trying to attract good talent. They're trying to validate a market. They're trying to like look for product market fit. They're looking for feedback anywhere they can get it. And I tend so, to favor that approach. <laughs> that? So I tend to favor that approach. Yeah. Um, and I, I know a lot of people that follow that same approach. And I think it's become more common because people have realized that people are mostly too busy to steal your idea. Like the, everyone's got their own thing going on. They don't understand the idea the way you do. So unless you've got something really obvious, it's, it's not theftable. And if it's really obvious, it's probably already been done. Or someone, so, will, yeah, exactly. Or someone will figure like, it out because yeah. maybe the tech just came out a week ago that you're trying to act right. on, but you've got seven competitors you don't know about at least, you know? Right. Like there, there are times when, yeah, you might have to keep things pretty zipped up quiet. Um, there's usually lawyers involved in those decisions. You know, sometimes it's government contract stuff. Like who knows, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, for the most part, um, the the secrets, like the fully stealth startup mentality, is isn't always necessary. Yeah, um, I'm inclined to agree. Sometimes, sometimes it's just done by default. Like, I you people just aren't talking about it because they're not quite confident enough in it yet, and they don't want they don't want to talk about it until they they get a little bit more confident that they're onto something. Yeah, um, I guess that I've makes seen, so it's an ego know. thing. Like you're worried about getting yeah. embarrassed if you let this idea out into the world. Well, or or just like you want you want it to be successful. It, it's almost like the not the anxiety of the of it of the failure, but you want to be putting your you, your personal capital on something that is exciting and feels like really viable. And so you want to like put your best foot forward, right? Yeah. Um, and it, I, I think I think that's a a pretty common uh, desire. It's just whether or not you can pull it off. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I remember maybe it was a year ago. Um, there were two different companies that um, my team was looking at working with, 
Mm -hmm. and they were direct competitors and one of them was in stealth and one of them was not and i think i think it was actually an offshoot from the same group and they they just went two different directions with it and i won't say what they were doing because i don't want to you know betray anyone's secrecy but i'll say that the one that wasn't in stealth appeared to be greatly outperforming the one that was in stealth um from you know visiting both of their facilities and talking to them closely and seeing the technology and the directions they went. The one that wasn't in stealth, um, I mean, I met the founder of that company at a trade event where he showed me a video of the technology like within a minute of meeting him. The one that was in stealth, um, I met them through a referral through a, another contract engineering company that was going to kick it over. And then it was like a series of phone calls and then NDAs. And then mm-hmm. you talk to yeah. this person, they'll introduce you to that person. Yeah. And then you start making calls, you know, and like getting references on these people and, and digging into it. You're like, wow, they really don't seem to have as much as the guys that are just openly talking about it. And yeah. I think part of that has to have been, you know, that the ones that were talking about it openly because they were, you know, getting it out in the world and socializing it were probably getting better feedback earlier on that they could incorporate yeah. into their design I, and attract I, better absolutely. talent. And also, yeah. you know, like, you know, just base their decisions off of reality rather than hypothesis. Yeah, yeah you get be- better signal, better access to talent. And those things early on, like you think about a team of three that adds one person to that team, like the percentage you can leap forward on that, if that's a good hire, is is massive. And you want the the right people on the boat early. So putting that word that the word out about what you're doing it, it often will get to the right people yeah and so not to mention that, i mean oh, sorry i didn't mean to cut you off yeah, okay good i was gonna say your company's culture is is instrumental in success and and that's a function of the average of the people that are there totally <laughs> yeah so, yeah but one of the one of the things i tell startups that i work with is like there, there's a there's an alarm bell that goes off at some point where you're going to hear someone in in a startup say when do we add marketing or how do we add marketing like and it's that that's the the indicator like ah it's it's about time to start thinking about this sort of thing right yeah but they're not evenly weighted questions it it's could it like 98% how do we add marketing and about 2% when and the the reason for that is like marketing started when you started your company, right? As soon as you decided what you were going to make, who it was for, the story you tell when you're trying to hire someone, all of that storytelling is part of what's going to be the foundation for your marketing. And so you, you've already started. So it's really just a question of then like, okay, well, how are we going to do this? And then you start thinking about tactics and what's unique to your situation that you're going to need. Um, like there are some tactics that are pretty common across across different categories, but there are some that are very unique. And so there isn't a template for how, um, it, but that is where the bulk of the work is. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I guess I'm fortunate to have, you know, a marketing advisor I really, really respect and uh, Just Patterson, who I've talked to you about before. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, she really helped me realize that, you know, it's there's no option. Like, you can't not be doing it. Um, yep. I think I told you I have a relative um, that, you know, was a pretty high powered uh, executive in a large company. Uh, he retired recently. But um He told me that at the scale of business that, you know, SKA is at the biggest mistake that I could make with respect was to marketing was not to, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that really left a huge mark. So, you know, I I agree wholeheartedly with all of that. And and also like, what, what does it mean to do marketing, right? Like marketing is vastly more than placing ads. Sure. You know, it, 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 to go back to where we started the conversation, like marketing's a discipline in the same way that like skiing is a discipline. You can, you can go skiing for the day and have a good time. But if you want to be a pro skier and like race world cup GS, you have to understand how everything connects. 
it's it's your your equipment it's knowing conditions it's knowing nutrition it's knowing sleep patterns it's knowing competitors and you've refined stuff to the point where activities are a reflex that all interconnect and you can't just change one thing you have to like think about the impacts of it change on all the other things makes sense to me um when you can introduce marketing particularly to like really technical folks as a more inter- interconnected discipline lights kind of come on of like ah okay <laughs> there like i see this now more like you know how someone might look at a circuit board or like a, a chipset like it's th- there is the thing itself but there is all of the other things that it powers and connects with and relies upon and that that interconnectedness once it gets started you you don't unravel that like that becomes like to your point part of your company's culture i think it has to be for your company to be successful Mm -hmm. yep totally um so to go back to um how to start marketing though i just want to revisit one thing there that it's it is different for a lot of companies, but there there are a couple of things that are similar. And one of the things that I've really latched onto with some of the folks I've worked with is around demos. And this this is a really fascinating moment of intersection between like the, the product side of the house and the marketing side of the house. Because giving a great demo is not a skill that is inherent in making the product. You you have to learn how to get good at demos. And that is a learnable skill, but it is not it, it's not innate. So I work with companies to basically rebuild their whole approach to demo. Oh, that's and, interesting. And and make that instead of a point of anxiety, right? Like you You've, I'm sure you've given product demos before, right? And you know how that feels, right? Like the, the moment before you start a demo and you're just like... Hope nothing yeah. breaks. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, right? <laughs> and hope is not a strategy. It's not. So... Yeah. Not practice. You, <laughs> Contingency. Yeah, exactly. What have yeah. you done to prep for this so that you know it's going to go smoothly in terms of how the audience sees it right i've run product demos that have had like some serious problems but the audience never knew that because they've never seen your thing before they don't know they know what the expectation that you set so if you're prepped for slight left turns deviations flipping scripts um if you've got a really good backbench of engineering behind you that's shelled into the robot on our viz and is like (laughs) watching to make sure that you know things are going right like you can reboot a robot in the middle of a demo and your audience doesn't have to know that happened that's awesome But but the only way you can pull that off is if you've practiced and if you really have a very careful approach to how you've built that demo um because we've all seen failed demos right yeah i mean i think the sony ibo climbing the stairs is a famous one uh, a, a a certain a certain person put a a metal ball through the window of a pickup truck once. Oh yeah, I heard about that. <laughs> Sorry, <twice. laughs> um, and so when I saw that, I originally thought that was intentional. Like I'm like, oh, it's just having some fun. <laughs> like I thought it was supposed to because I didn't know. <laughs> so. His history on that one, I, I think, has a, a few versions that will get written down, and you know, one of them's right, and some of the others are not. And uh, <laughs> there are there are people who are very we're very close to that situation that really know, and the rest of us know what what the best we can figure out. But irrespective of that, um, demos fail a lot, and it's an evidence of an attitude that is just like, well, what do you mean? I just show the product to people, right? That's a demo. And that's a long way from 
the sort of precision and accuracy that you need if you want to run flawless demos all the time. And demos are one common thing that like, no matter what your startup's doing, you got to be able to give a demo and you got to know your audience. You got to know, is this like a, a hiring an employee demo? Is this an investor demo? Is it a media demo? Is it a sales demo? And that you got to understand the environments that you can give those in. Cause like they can be in real life in person. They can be virtual. Um, all of those factors matter. And so another whole chapter in the book on that, but it is one of the topics that, uh, particularly in the robotic space that I got really good at because it, it was a function of survival, right? Like you just had to, and you build all of these contingencies in because you know how it works. And if you practice, you know where the common failure points are and how to quickly mm -hmm. mitigate them. Right. And, and r really, there are three, right? The, the, the demons of demo, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and battery. Hilarious. That most demo problems are one of those three things. Yeah. Wi-Fi, definitely. I mean, there's ways around that. Like, I, I know th there's a demo we gave during the pandemic where we let people drive robots through a obstacle course. And I'm looking at it now because all the cameras for the podcast studio are mounted on it. <laughs> but um, basically it was like a five kilo robot and people could drive yep. it through um, like a industrial maze that we had now to work Broadway set designer develop and mm -hmm. uh, use Formant to be able to drive it. So those guys set uh -huh. up their software on our robot and um, we just gave people the controls and made it a competition and the common failure was actually the robot flipping over because, well, there were a few of them. So one, one was um, a bolt would vibrate loose. Um, this yep. happened once and land on the NVIDIA board that was controlling the thing and cause a short circuit. <laughs> which, yeah, luckily, it didn't yeah. blow up. It just power cycled when that happened. So that wasn't too bad. You know, Loctite mm -hmm. is how you fix that. Um, another one that occurred was Wi-Fi outages, to quote you. Um, mm-hmm. So we um, we had a pretty awesome industrial grade Wi-Fi access point put into the office after that, mm -hmm. and then another one was we originally when we were practicing that we wanted to use a uh, a spark gap generator to make the industrial maze look a little bit more sinister. So the mm -hmm. idea was to have like a wire hanging and sparking against the floor with like a 15 kilovolt power supply. Super what dangerous. Yeah, what could possibly go wrong? It turns out it jams your Wi-Fi. <laughs> <So> <laughs> And then on the battery side, we had right. we had like eight batteries for these things with like four chargers just constantly cycling in and out. Yeah. Um, and then we had backup robots, so we had we had three <laughs> robots that we would we would run um, that were all set up to run the same demo that you could quickly switch over to and fail over to and use like when yep. you're servicing one or swapping the battery, you could yep. pull up another one. Um, Another thing that would happen is there was a feature on the maze that was a tunnel with a bunch of J-hooks along the side that carried cable. And then mm -hmm. there was uh, an obstacle, which was it was like a fog machine that was hooked in to look like a steam leak coming out of a hose that was going along that cable tray. But what would happen was the, um, the J-hooks, the, the top of the robot chassis would get caught on the J-hook and it would invert in a way where it was like a turtle on its back and it couldn't get up. And so... We we started keeping like brooms and sticks around <laughs> to get get them yep. unstuck when that would happen. Uh, so yeah, uh, plenty of so plenty sometimes of things. Sometimes analog solutions are the best. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, we kind of got lucky that a lot of the people driving them were engineers, you know, and and sort of yep. were understanding about some of the the shortcomings. But and we found a lot of these when we were testing, but some of them just came out live and. Yep. You know, I mean, if it had been like an investor demo, I think it would have gone differently, <laughs> but. Uh, that that that's yeah. part of practice, right? Yeah. And also understanding, like the for for each demo, what's the cost of failure, right? Because like in a lot of cases, the cost of failure is it can kill your entire startup. Yeah. And so, understanding that, like, if you're not ready to give a demo, don't give the demo. Yeah. Because no demo is better than a failed demo, and if if a failed demo is going to kill your startup. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And and that's a that's a cultural thing as much as anything of like your, your whole org has to line up around 
what has to be true before we're willing to give a demo? And are all of those boxes checked? Not most of them, but are all of them? Yeah. And uh, so that 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 part's like that's the kind of discipline that let when when I was at Mayfield, and we were launching that the the curry robot at at CES back in uh, 2017. Like that approach is why we won best of CES. We had the robot that worked no matter what all nice. the time, <laughs> and it was contingencies and backups and really sharp engineers that and a lot of practice on call <laughs> that's awesome it, it, absolutely yeah. um but it's like this was we only had one chance to do it yeah and so it's like we didn't skimp on stuff yeah it makes sense if it's that critical the company's success you can't afford to right and so it's like that that whole just like you said when we started the, the demo topic right that like i hope this goes well it's like no, you you need to be so confident that you don't worry about it. That it's yeah. it's as easily it's as easy as anything. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I, I think it depends what you're demoing and what the expectation of the user is too. Yep. If you're putting yep. it on display at CES, you know, then yes, sure, <laughs> I completely right. agree. Um, but like that was that was a coordinated thing where that was also the first time it had ever been seen by anybody. Yeah. So like it was a lot of stakes, like all the chips on the table all at once. It seems like that happens at CES a decent amount with different companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a big stage and it's yeah. a chance for like, I mean, at the time we were a company of like 40 something people. Right. So to, to win best in show awards and nominations from like Engadget and Wired and PC magazine for a company of 40 yeah. at a show like that, um, there's very very few places where you can you have the, even the access to that kind of visibility and and then you have to pull it off yeah uh, it's it's a noisy place right like it it's very noisy but um part part of winning in a situation like that is is the is the prep how'd you get around the bluetooth problem cuz like i don't even trust bluetooth with anything critical anymore uh, so Bluetooth was used for very limited parts of the, the demo. It was mostly over Wi-Fi. Yeah. It makes sense. Um, I, I've certainly right. seen Bluetooth, Bluetooth failures. Um, but they're way too common for like a sure. technology. I mean, that it's, sure. it's yeah. it is a fragile system, right? It's just the best one that we have. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> um, and uh so and some bluetooth radios are better than others for sure right and, and like we we knew at the time the features that we wanted to show that were really going to differentiate us were more on bringing the robot to life and making the robot's personality shine shine through and so that's that's what we focused on uh, but yeah it it is still a common failure point for a lot of, for a lot of people and so understanding like if if you have to plug something physically into the robot with a wire because bluetooth failed do you do you have a way to do that or is the port is the access port like underneath nine different things that you have to unscrew nice okay that's clever right? like those kind of questions yeah that yeah, makes sense to me and you know does everybody know the drill to plug it in i would assume is another part of it Right. Yeah. yeah. Like what, what script do we tool? have to load? Yeah. Where's the tools? Yeah. yeah. Where's you your backup practiced tools? it? Yeah, exactly. Is, is, is there a kit with each robot? Right. Like not one kit, but a key kit with each robot. Yeah. Um, yeah. I completely agree. Yep. Yeah. Um, and something you get from experience and practice. What are you excited for coming up? Uh, let's see. I've got a, a few companies I'm talking to right now. For, on different projects, they're all super interesting uh, in different robotics areas. I, I guess, kind of like you, I can't say too much about them other than like there, there's a lot of cool stuff happening in the, the nav and 3D spatial space right now. Oh, cool! The, um, like intersection of spatial AI and physical AI and computer vision 
like there's a, a lot of neat, neat new stuff there. Just figuring out what uh, you're looking at from yeah, sensors. Exactly. Basically. Okay, like, cool. What am I looking at? Where am I? Yeah. Where should I, where should I go? No, next, I agree. Right? That's that stuff is awesome. Um, and, Have you looked at uh, Velo AI at all? Which one? Velo AI. They're, uh, they're no. a Pittsburgh company. Clark Hayes is the founder. Yeah. Um, no, no, that one. The, it's it's a bunch of self driving uh, engineers that are applying that technology to bicycles. So oh, cool. they're they're doing like um, being aware of like regular driving behavior and cars around you and hmm. being able to um, be like safer on the road on a bicycle through sensors and tech and understanding what's going on. I have to take a look at that. Yeah, uh, if that you, is, happy, happy to make an mean, intro if you want one. <laughs> I, I mean. I, just want to see if I want to be a customer like that. Yeah, yeah. That's, let me, that's let me know what you think. I worry about, right? Um, like I, I, when I go, I was out riding this morning and like I got front and rear dash cams running on my bike all the time. Uh, just as a, you know, it's one thing I can do. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's still, that doesn't make me safer. The, the lights make me safer, but the, um, the, the idea of having better data when you're riding uh, is, is still something that has not been cracked. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, they're, they're as far along yeah. as anyone I know. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I, I I'll check them out. Definitely let me know what you think. Cool. Cool. Well, I, th I think we're at a good spot. Um, yeah. Anything you want Great. to plug on the way out? Um, uh, I mean, the, the book's called Start Telling People. Uh, it's on Amazon, both print and Kindle, as well as on Audible. Uh, I, I did the narration of the book myself. In nice. Nice. Little studio in Palo Alto, and uh, so that that was a really interesting experience as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, with if if any of your listeners end up picking up a copy, reading or listening to it, uh, I love the feedback, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, of like what resonates and what what people think is really interesting. What's the best way for people uh, to reach out to you if they want to give you that feedback? Uh, easiest way is through. Either through you find me on LinkedIn super easily, uh, or through the website, uh, which is verysmallrobots.com. Uh, that's my own site, and uh, so that's got links to the book and links to some previous work I've done. Uh, but uh, there's a, a contact form there, or just Chris at verysmallrobots.com gets me as well. Awesome. Well, Chris, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. It's been a blast. Thanks for having me. This is super fun. Yeah, I agree. We'll have to do it again sometime. All right. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.